I'm Kristen Oaks-White. And I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. Floodwaters cover farmers' fields and grazing lands all across North Louisiana, in some places still more than five feet deep. The water is still there more than two weeks after a major storm dumped more than two feet of rain on parts of the state over a three-day period. Here you see cattle on a levee still unable to get to their pastures. Ranchers in this area moved more than 2,000 head of cattle as these waters began to rise. Those who could not get their cattle out are now relying on the help of neighbors to rescue their cattle and bring them to dry ground. Pumps continue to run in Natchitoches Parish, pulling water from flooded areas and dumping them on the other side of the levee to drain into the Saline Bayou. Jolly Nash lost nearly 80 grown cows and 70 calves to the flood. He says it's during disasters like this flood that you see the best come out in the agricultural community. We've seen uh, people from all over the country calling, checking on us, offering trucks, uh, workers, cowboys, uh, hay, uh, even pasture land, extra land. And uh, this, this community and country in the farming and ranching industry has certainly come together with a helping hand trying to help us, you know, make it through this tough time. At the nearby Red River Auction Barn, you can see some of that help stacked up in the form of hay. This is all that's left of three truckloads of hay donated through the Louisiana Farm Bureau's Hay Clearing House to ranchers in northwestern Louisiana. Rayburn Smith manages the Red River Livestock Barn. He says this hay is high quality and is exactly what his neighbors need if they're going to remain in the cattle business. I've got one neighbor right down the road here. She's got 600 cows and they're on a little island and they're nothing for him to eat and all the ground's covered so he's looking 30 days minimum. Uh, I talked with him as early as this morning and uh, he'll be, he'll sure be, uh, you know, out of business without this support. Smith, who is a rancher himself, says the silver lining to this flood is that it happened early enough that pastures can grow back by the summer if the floodwaters recede fast enough. As for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Livestock Committee's hay clearing house, it will continue. As a courtesy to ranchers, the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry had been hauling the hay free of charge to ranchers in need. However, with fire season about to begin, those trucks will have to go back into service. Hay Clearing House Coordinator Carrie Martin says ranchers will now have to make their own arrangements to pick up hay if they need it. To find out more about the Hay Clearing House, you can visit our website at twilatv.org. Moving east into the Delta region, floodwaters are preventing grain farmers from planting. In Catahoula Parish, the Black River is currently above flood stage at 53.7 feet, according to the National Weather Service. Last week's rain, combined with the Black River's backwater, continues to push more flooding into the parish. At the Louisiana Delta Plantation, more than 6,000 acres of farmland are underwater. General Manager Wendell Walker says that even if the river started to drop today, it would still be at least a month before his farmers could get in the field to plant. It doesn't look good, uh, especially for us here on this farm, because uh, our water can't go anywhere until the river goes down, so any additional rain is just going to uh, flood that many more acres. Walker says that unlike Concordia Parish, Catahoula Parish does not have an Army Corps of Engineers pumping station to pump excess water out of the parish. Just northwest of Catahoula Parish, near the community of Hebert, Flooding remains a problem. Our good friend Tammy Oranger with the LSU Ag Center sent us this report. I am between the towns of Columbia and Hebert, just off of Highway 4 in Caldwell Parish. And as you can see in the fields behind me, it is taken over by the floodwaters of Bayou Lafouche that continues to rise and eat up and swallow up acres and acres of pasture land. Now, according to LSU Ag Center Extension Agent Jim McCann, only about 200 acres of corn had been planted before the flood event, but others are now waiting to see when it will dry out for them to get in the field. Field. I'm Tammy Orinder for the LSU Ag Center reporting from Caldwell Parish. Thank you, Tammy, for that report. We'll be hearing more from Tammy as the floodwaters go down. 
26 parishes in Louisiana are part of a federal disaster declaration. That includes all of the parishes we've shown you on this week's show. Louisiana Farm Service Agency Executive Director Craig McCain says that federal disaster declaration opens the door for farmers and ranchers to receive assistance from the USDA. McCain says that for those with cattle, the Livestock Indemnity Program, and the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm-Raised Fish Program are there to help. The Emergency Conservation Program helps with conservation losses such as sedimentation and damage to fences. McCain says it's a cost share program. However, with so many parishes already in the presidential disaster declaration, McCain says low interest emergency loans would be available to farmers and ranchers who need them to stay in business. He says that's in addition to crop insurance and non-insured crop programs in the farm bill. So certainly you're going to see crop insurance uh, companies and agents and producers working to analyze the options available uh, within those insurance policies, but I'd also encourage those uh, members of the agricultural community who have purchased NAP policies and have them in effect to work with FSA, make your notice of loss. You know, the key to this whole disaster issue is once you ascertain what your losses are, report them timely to the appropriate uh, agency or official and keep records. You know, pictures, receipts, Anything that you believe substantiates your situation certainly would be helpful. McCain suggests that you contact your local FSA office to see what programs are available to you. To find your local FSA office, click on over to our website, twilighttv.org. Two weeks after all of that rain and flooding hit North Louisiana, people are still talking about it online. People continued to post photos and videos of flood water damage on Facebook and Twitter. Ryan Yerby posted this photo of his newly planted cornfield completely submerged underwater. The flood waters also hurt bee colonies in North Louisiana. DeSoto Parish beekeeper Randy Fair posted these photos on Facebook. He says the flooding destroyed at least 77 of his hive colonies. AJ Sabine will have more on that story next week. In southwest Louisiana, flooding from the Sabine River even caused caskets to float to the surface, according to the Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Office. Hundreds of pets are also homeless after the flood hit Louisiana. The Wachita Parish Animal Shelter is over capacity and posted an urgent message on Facebook with photos of lost pets who need to be rescued or adopted by new owners. While flood water was a trending topic in Louisiana, people were also talking about the water worldwide for another reason. Mark March 22nd was World Water Day, and people celebrated by posting photos, infographics, and videos on social media. The American Farm Bureau Federation posted an excellent status discussing how water gives farmers security. In case you missed it, you can check it out on our Twyla Facebook page. Well, now it's time for this week's Twyla Trivia. Last time I asked you, which city will host the 2020 Commodity Classic? And the correct answer is B, San Antonio, Texas. This week's question is, about how much water does the average American use each day? Is it A, 20 gallons, B, 100 gallons, or C, 2,000 gallons? To enter this week's trending trivia contest, simply log on to your Facebook or Twitter account and post your answer with the hashtag Twyla Trivia, or you can always submit your answer on our website at twilighttv.org. The 2016 regular Louisiana legislative session is underway, and while representatives and senators will not be able to consider revenue-raising bills, there are some which could still impact agriculture. House Concurrent Resolution 9, filed by Major Tebow of New Roads, would establish the Feral Hog Management Advisory Task Force. The eight-member task force would be charged with finding ways to manage feral hogs and raise public awareness. That is on its way to the full House after passing out of the House Committee on Natural Resources and Environment. The legislature will also again consider a bill that would allow the sale of raw milk to consumers. Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry Dr. Mike Strain has spoken out against previous bills. We'll keep an eye on these measures as they make their way through the legislature. There are now three new inductees into the Louisiana Agriculture Hall of Distinction. The Louisiana Radio Network and the LSU Ag Center held the annual event at La Burge Casino Resort in Baton Rouge last week. Inducted this year were former Louisiana Farm Service Agency Executive Director Willie Cooper. For more than 42 years, Cooper served the farmers and ranchers of Louisiana. Also inducted was Reuben Dozat of Marksville for his substantial role in agricultural production. 
Dozat was also the 2014 Outstanding Master Farmer. And inducted posthumously was Raymond Henskins of Crowley. Henskins founded GH Seed, a company which helped the success of Clearfield Rice. Wayne Henskins accepted the award on behalf of his family. Louisiana Radio Network President Jim Inkster kicked off the event and noted what an emotional night it was for recipients. This is the culmination of a great career, and, and people don't get to this point without help from a lot of others. And I think it really, the weight of the significance of the event comes forth in a, on a night like this. The weight of the night becomes poignant to them as they address their friends, their followers, their fans, and their loved ones, and it doesn't get any better than this. The induction of Cooper, Dozat, and Henskins brings the total up to nine in the Hall of Distinction. It was a great event. It was so nice being there and seeing it. It was quite emotional, as you saw in the video. It looked I mean, like it. Yeah, Dozat going to tears while up there, and obviously the Henskins family very moved that you know, uh, Ray would be inducted into the Hall of Distinction. The upside is next year, three more will be going in and they'll be opening it up for nominations in the near future. It'll look like a very special night. Well, still to come on Twyla, we get a taste of the Emerald Isle in the Big Easy in this edition of Feasting on Agriculture. But first, Louisiana farmers and ranchers helping feed those in need. Next. <laughs> The Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee gathered about $2,000 worth of groceries for a great cause. The Ronald McDonald House serves families with children who must stay long term in a hospital, offering a family a home away from home. A large part in making the house a home is the food inside. Each year, the Women's Leadership Committee gathers groceries from across the state to bring to the Ronald McDonald Houses in New Orleans and Monroe. Donations like this keep the home open to help families in need. The Louisiana Farm Bureau brings the largest donation each year to the Ronald McDonald chapter in New Orleans. This year's trip will provide the home with food for the next six months. Freezers were filled and pantry stocked with food from farmers and ranchers across Louisiana. Just about every parish in the state supports this project and so when you consider you have all of these districts, 11 districts with their parishes, um, each contributing financially or bringing, having a material, you know, product that is grown and uh, manufactured in their area, you consider how much that brings in, it is a lot of food. Here you see the donation made to the Ronald McDonald House in Monroe. According to Executive Director Georgia Street, the Louisiana Farm Bureau Women's Committee has been giving food to the Ronald McDonald House for 20 years. And that's a great organization mm -hmm. in Monroe, and she is a great representative for the Ronald McDonald House. And she knows how to work the media, because we got that video from our sister station, our affiliate KNOE up there in Monroe. Mm -hmm. You know how she convinced them that they should go and cover it? I heard. She personally brought peanut butter bars over to them to uh, homemade so that they would come out and cover it. She knows what she's doing. <laughs> well, in this special edition of Feasting on Agriculture, Twyla's A.J. Sabine takes us to Ireland via New Orleans to celebrate the Feast of St. Patrick's Day. There, A.J. introduces us to Chef Matt Murphy, owner of the Irish House New Orleans, who pairs traditional corned beef hash with fresh, locally grown produce from the Crescent City Farmer's Market to create a mouth-watering Irish classic. Feasting on Agriculture with A.J. Sabine is brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, Louisiana Crawfish, Ask Before You Eat, by the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board, Rice, a World of Great Ideas, and by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, Beef, It's What's for Dinner. Diagwitch from the Irish House here in New Orleans, where it's always St. Patrick's Day. All that and more coming up on Feasting on Agriculture. Nestled just across from a streetcar named St. Charles, Chef Matt Murphy's Irish House has become part of the iconography of this historic avenue in New Orleans. Before it's time to grab a pint and start cooking, Chef Matt and I begin our day shopping at the Crescent City Farmer's Market in Uptown Square. So here we are on the Uptown Farmer's Market. Chef, why is this one of your favorite farmer's markets? Well, you know, all over the state you've got markets like this. This is one of the markets in New Orleans, and actually all over, all over New Orleans. It's where, you know, you can get local produce grown by local people. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, just get be in touch with where the food's coming from. So many times, you know, you're, you go into a, a large supermarket, you, you can't see the person that's grown it. It's on a shelf, and you know, you know where it's coming from. From here, you know, it's coming from Louisiana. You know, it's coming from people that are growing it. Uh, whether it's eggs, whether it's produce, all the way down. Shopping a farmer's market can reveal a whole host of surprise ingredients. Say, for example, these mustard flowers and, of course... Now, you're from Dublin. What do you think of that? It's cool I think it's say. phenomenal. See, you can get everything you want. <laughs> You'll have a leprechaun up there next, right? <laughs> With our shopping done, it's time to get our ingredients into the kitchen. We got some beautiful ingredients from the farmer's market. How will we put this together today? Well, when we were shopping around there, I knew coming to some of the, I had some red fish I was going to use. I knew I had some beef. I, I wanted to use some crawfish along here. So I was kind of coming up with a little idea in my head. Did I have a plan? No. <laughs> Didn't have a plan. But we're going to take, uh, we're going to take these fava beans and we're going to pop out the, uh, the fava beans in them. Okay. And we're going to blanch these just for a second or two in some salted water. Okay. Um, not too much, just just, uh, just enough to uh, make them tender, so when we use them in a succotash that we're going to use um, with our redfish. As Chef Matt and I break down the ingredients, he shares with us his experience on the Food Network show, Chopped. I was a bit apprehensive, but when I got there, I really realized that that, that show uh, takes a lot out of you. It does. You have to know a lot about food, you have to know what you're doing, um, and you have to be fast, and you have to be concise, and, that, and that's... And lucky enough, I've had a lot of experience in kitchen, so... I can adapt and to many different things, and, 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 and I won it. So it was also a badge, not just a badge of honor for me, it's a badge of honor for New Orleans and Louisiana. After we get prepped, it's time to cook. What we use here is, um, we like these French pans. You see them? Yes. Uh, Why do you like the French pans? Solid. Okay. This has killed many a person <laughs> because it's like a weapon. And when it gets hot, it does not cool down. And that's what you want. Yeah, you get something that has a steady heat. Um, so once you put that fish or ingredient in there, it doesn't go. It stays sizzling nice, and the crispiness of the fish stays goes and cooks it all the way through. We have some, you know, the, the, the you like to get that fish that's the younger fish, the smaller fish, the stuff that is not um, those big, big, big fillets. There's two sides to a fish. There's a presentation side, or on an item, there's the presentation side and it's the side that's on the plate. Presentation side is always the first side you put on the skillet. Why? Because it gets, you can control the color of it, you can control how it looks. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that on there. How can I help? And here, this is, you're gonna throw those on right there. Like this? Yeah. Make, as you're doing it, let it flow away from you. So if there is a splash, it's going at the back of the stove. Now potatoes is uh, cooked down and some corned beef. And we're just gonna heat this up a little bit. This is gonna go underneath our fish and our succotash is going to go around it. You know, you think succotash, you think it's uh, the south, you know? Right. Well, it comes from up north, Rhode Island, the succotash tribe, basically. This was a dish they made with corn, a wild corn. He's not like using red beans. You know, you see a lot of places using haricot vert. Mm -hmm. Why not use red beans? It's a local, it's a local bean. So we're going to start off with a little bit of garlic and a little bit of uh, shallots, which is a uh, shallot for those. A little salt and pepper in there. I like to do that. You've got to watch the cooking of this right here. Right. Simply because um, you don't want to burn your garlic. You don't want to burn your garlic, but you do want it to get that flavor out of it. And then we're going to throw in our beans, red beans, and our corn, which we've uh, sauteed down a little bit. And we're going to take our fava beans, and we're going to we have some salted water here, seasoned. We're going to let that cook down in that. Our fish, as you can see, is cooking nicely. What I want to do is just blanch him and slowly add them in there. So we're right in there, the hot water. I'm going to put that to the side. We had a little bit of vinegar in, 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 that we had mixed in with, it, with the, um, the red beans and the corn. I've never seen a secretaire with cream in it before. Yeah, well, and it helps make, make a sauce. Because ah. as that cream reduces down and I mount in the butter, mm -hmm. it just has a really, 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 really uh, rich, rich flavor. And when we get back, I'll show you a brand new pair of beers to go with this fresh take on corned beef. Stick around, we'll be right back. Here we are in the dining room of the Irish House New Orleans, joined by Chef Matt Murphy, owner and operator. And Chef, this is a beautiful succotash redfish with corned beef hash. 
Tell us about uh, this beer. Yes. That I'm, I'm, uh, tell me. Okay. All right. Tell me about it. What, what is this you just opened? Well, this is a, uh, this is made by uh, Chapawaya Farms. Sandy, Sandy Sharp out there. Don't worry, this is good froth. We're gonna gotcha. it, it's vacuum good for that up. It's good for the skin. Um, he's come up with this uh, farmhouse saison. Uh, kind of a, a, a beer, which is like a rich in flavor. I think it's going to go great with this dish. He also does a, a porter, a oh, farmhouse nice. porter, which is good. You'll see them. The uh, Chapawaya Farms are known. They're Covey Rise Farms. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, the same people that do Covey Rise, and they have a, a, a market there where they actually. Um, you pour. I'm going to eat. I'm pour. You try. Oh my God, that's so good. That's absolutely delicious. And this red fish that we made. What are you kidding? You don't have to wait to celebrate St. Patrick's Day here on, on Feasting on Agriculture. You can always come to the, New Orleans, the Irish House New Orleans and visit with Chef Matt. Yes, sir. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm gonna try this beer with it. This uh, Chapawaya Farmhouse Saison. Cheers. Here's to you. Lots more to come on it's Feasting on Agriculture. Bon temps roulé. Bon temps roulé. Feasting on Agriculture. We'll see you next time. Feasting on Agriculture with A.J. Sabine was brought to you by the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board. Louisiana Crawfish, ask before you eat. By the Louisiana Rice Promotion Board. Rice, a world of great ideas. And by the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Well, the last time we checked in with the American Farm Bureau Market Basket Survey, we finally saw a drop in food prices. Has it continued in 2016? Joining us now for this week's Bottom Line is Neil Malasaw. And Neil, <laughs> you better tell me that that's the truth, that the food prices have dropped. They have dropped, and this time there's no exception, no but about it. This quarter survey showed a drop of about 60 cents, or 1% from the last survey in 2015. Breaking it down, the 16 items on the survey cost $53.28, 10 of which were lower in price, while we did see an increase in six of those items. That's a reverse of recent years where all prices were higher. Taking a look further, we can see drops in items that have been flat to higher in price thus far. Bag salad took a double digit loss, down 11% to $2.20 per pound. Whole milk is down 6% to $3.23 a gallon. And ground chuck meat is down 5% to $4.36 a pound. Now, that high Higher production is really starting to hammer in on those meat prices, as you can see. Down to the meat and potato foods here. White bread is down 3% to $1.69 a loaf. Sirloin tip roast down 1% to $5.65 per pound, something we were thinking was going to happen with that last livestock report from the USDA. Potatoes go down to, with that steak as well, down 1% to $2.71 for a five pound bag. Now, some items did increase, and we can see issues associated associated with these items as why. Apples are seeing a huge boom with prices increasing 12% to $1.64 a pound with exports to Mexico and India soaring. Supply is coming down there, so thus the higher price. Eggs are up 9% to $2.23 a dozen, and we have avian influenza to thank for that. Bacon is even up 8%, and that's due to a combination of better marketing for pork products, high demand, and a hangover from all that PED virus, all contributing factors there, but look for bacon and all pork products to start coming down this year as production is really starting to ramp up. The bottom line is we're finally starting to see the drop at the grocery store that we've been expecting. I expect that drop in prices to continue really through 2016, barring any major disruptions to the food supply. By the way, all of the items on the survey can be found by going to twilatv.org and following the link we have there. And guys, you know, we're finally starting to see this long prediction to drop in prices and I think it will stick around this time because there's just a lot of negative pressure on the commodity prices that's going to keep these prices either flat to lower as we go on. And even with prices dropping, what I think people also need to keep in mind is just how little of their food dollar actually goes right. back to the farm. At uh, $53.28 for that, I believe the farmer's share was eight and a half dollars. Oh, geez. Well, we need to 
find some way to even it out somewhere. Thank yep. you very much, Neil Malasson. Well, that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we'll continue our coverage of the flood of 2016. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online on our website, twylatv.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week. Thank you.